kid in 1979. I was six years old and I lived there for a year. My dad taught at a university in South Korea and he sh shared his photos of South Korea when I was growing up. And I always wanted to go back to Korea. So in 2006, I uh, filled my backpack full of stuff and, and got a camera and, and did a trip across Mongolia, China and ended up in South Korea. And when I got to South Korea, I started teaching English. I was running out of money and um, yeah, got a job teaching at a, a middle school. And then eventually I taught at a university for about 10 years up until about four years ago. And during that time, while I was teaching, I had a lot of vacation. I had uh, vacation in the summer and winter months, and I would travel all around Asia. And I really got into photography during that time. So that's kind of how I started or kind of got started in, in travel photography. Good, good. So, uh, so you have been to so many countries, you know, like how many countries can you remember? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I can't remember exactly how many, I think over 40, um, 40 or 50, I think. But um, I've been all throughout Northeast Asia and, and Southeast Asia. So I've, I've traveled quite a bit. Yeah. And you are from U US, oh, right? Yes, US. I'm from the US. So I'm from Connecticut, which is right between New York and Boston. I'm about a two to two and a half hour drive to, to Manhattan, right in, in New York City. So you're from US, then you moved to South Korea. And yes. then now you travel around the world and take beautiful photos. Yes, ma mainly in in Asia, though. I haven't. So I did go so, to Europe. So I'm really glad let me just mute off for now. First, later we have a Q&A session. So I'm going to temporarily mute the rest. I said, Pete, <laughs> let me just unmute you back. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, temporary, sorry, temporarily I have you, you mute you off so that uh, we can have this, you know, the, the session going on smoothly. So if you have any question, feel free to leave the message in the chat room. Here and later we have a QA section and you guys can unmute and ask P any question. Okay. So uh just on where we we you know we talk about like okay, you move to South South Korea and then you get into full time photographer. So do you enjoy your life now as a full time travel photographer? Yes, yeah. I, I haven't been traveling as much though, obviously lately. So yeah. Okay, yeah. just share a little bit. Uh, how I met Pete, you know, I met him when he came to Malaysia with another friend, which is Jimmy. So um, he came here, so I hosted them, I brought them around, take some photos, and of course, uh, brought them to taste some delicious Malaysian foods, ensure that they gain some weight. You know, that's my, that's always one of my objective when some our overseas photographer came to Malaysia. I always make sure they gain some weight when they when they when they when they go back to their country. You're very and, good at that. <laughs> okay, so uh, so next question, like uh, you know, you have been to so many countries. I know that you have prepared some photos that you want to share with us. You know, how about you share with us that those photos and you know okay. like. Okay, yeah, just, just share with us so, and press, just tell us a little bit about those story behind all those photos. I believe that everyone would like to know more about that. That's a perfect segue because uh, yeah. Vincent just posted, uh, asked, which countries left the most memories for you? I mean, in terms of photography. So I think everybody's like, let's just see the photos, man. Tell us the good places to go. Um, okay, so let yeah. me share here. So I put together a little presentation here, 21 must see destinations in Asia. And I have to say that these are more geared towards landscape, cityscape, drone photographers. It's not really about uh, people photography or street photography. Although of course you can find stuff in these places, but I really wanted to do a kind of uh, list of what are my favorite places in Asia for landscape photography. So 
Before we get started, can anyone guess where this is, the photo on the left? If you guys able to guess it, just, you know, just leave the message in the chat room or you can leave the comment there. In the I, Facebook I, can't live. See the, I can't see the comments when I'm screaming. Okay, everyone says Thailand. Yes, <laughs> where, where in Thailand? Where in Thailand? Rico says Budan and Willy says the Thailand. And Jason asked, do we get a price for right guess? Yes, I, I will send a pizza to your house. <laughs> uh, really say Chiang Mai. Another friend is Wilson, I believe he said Vietnam. Okay. It's, it's Thailand. It's it's uh, in Southern Thailand. It's Southern Thailand. I, yeah. I thought it's in Myanmar. Because no. Myanmar, you have, you have similar place right. like that. Right. Oh, well, I'm going to, I'll tell you a little bit. It's midway through this presentation, so you'll find out. Good. So, okay, for what did that? These are uh, some of my favorite places for photography in Asia. So I'll just kind of start up in north, in the north, northeast Asia. This is Kiyomizudera Temple in Kyoto. For me, definitely Kyoto is one of the top destinations in Asia for uh, landscape, cityscape, temples, and that sort of thing. Obviously, they have this sakura or cherry blossoms. And the thing I like about uh, this temple is that also they light up the cherry blossoms at night. And it's made of wood, this whole temple. I don't think there's a single steel um, nail in the whole temple. It's all just pure wood. So yeah. what happened when you went there? Uh, Great, yeah. I know that you said you went there recently. <laughs> okay, you know, when you first show this photo on the screen, I actually roll my eye, okay? Because this is one of the photos that on my bucket list, you know, one of the destination on my bucket list. But when at the time, I couldn't get any shot because the whole place, the whole temple is under construction. And right. it's going to take years to complete the whole, I think it's renovation. I think it's they are repairing it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's going to take years. So uh, last I heard, I don't know when you're going to complete, but you're going to take, still have a few more years to go, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Okay. The place well, is still I, accessible. Yeah. For those that want, want, want to go there in the future, it's still accessible, but you you know, it's like uh, most of the temple will be covered up with, uh, you know, like all those like construction stuff and uh, the huge cloak. Yeah. Yeah. I think you'll agree Kyoto is just, has so many different things that you can photograph. Yes. Um, also, if you go there in the in the autumn, in the fall, you can get the the foliage, the, the leaves changing. It's another great, in fact, that's, I think when you went there, right? Yeah, you that's the season fall. that I went there yep. from. And other than that, they have nice foods, very, very tasty and delicious, okay? Although not so good for your, your health, your diet. And they have a, very nice toilet. <laughs> yeah, the warm toilet seats with the water. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. The water squirt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I like. I really like night photography. One of my tips for shooting night photography. People always ask me what's the best time to shoot. I don't think there is any one best time. Although for sure the most popular is probably blue hour. Um, so I, you know, right after the sun sets, you can get that light blue in the sky and you can get a lot of the, the natural light can still light up the landscape. And it's also not too tough on your camera's sensor. I mean, you can, you can get a lot of detail in the shadows, um, and you don't really blow out the highlights as easily. So usually I try and shoot around blue hour, but I definitely also stay around well into nighttime. Okay. Next, uh -huh. next to Kyoto, right next to Kyoto is Osaka. And it's an incredible city. They have great food there. And it's, I think, it, what is it, an hour or two, it's an hour, maybe a little bit more train ride, I think, from Kyoto. I think a lot of people, they, they usually fly into Osaka and then go straight to Kyoto and only spend maybe one day in Osaka. But there's a lot to photograph in uh, Osaka. The cityscapes are incredible. Also, I love these overpasses. Yes. You know, there's a lot of earthquakes in Japan. And if you notice, there's no, um, nothing holding up this overpass. 
I call it a the Medusa. It has like the the Medusa with the snakes, like a yeah, the messy hair. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just standing under this thing is like a it's a marvel of, um, yeah, I think it's called oh. Medusa Junction. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's a it, these junction. I just love these junctions. That's one of the yeah. things that I love to photograph. So you have some very cool like trails at the bottom yeah. of the frame too. I like that. Yeah, this is the old photo. This is uh, quite a while back. Um, yeah. yeah. So this is uh, Osaka definitely would be one of my ah. favorite places. Moving on, uh, Korea. So another great place to photograph in Asia is uh, Soraksan National Park. It's, I think, about a two hour drive. I, I can't remember Seoul. exactly from Seoul, from Seoul uh, yeah. to the east of, of Seoul. And Soraksan has some incredible uh, foliage there. And I don't think it's as, it's not, Korea isn't as known, I think, you know, for travel photographers uh, when it comes to, you know, fall foliage, but there's some incredible sites there. And Soraksan is definitely uh, one of my favorite destinations. This, there's also um, trails that go all the way up to the, to the mountain peaks there. So if you're into hiking, I would definitely recommend uh, Soraksan National Park. It's a yes. great place. There's obviously four seasons there. So they have the winter and fall and spring. So Korea is a really, really great place for, for travel photography. There's so much there. Yeah, actually, I went there before. You know, Soraksan? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went there before and was like, uh, I went there for honeymoon with my wife. Oh, and, cool. Yeah. During what time the, of year did you go there? Uh, I think it's like April. Okay. During the spring for spring, the cherry yeah. blossom. Oh, nice. Yeah. And my, well, I love Shawasan because it's very beautiful. I know they have many, many viewpoints that yep. you can go there. I didn't went all the way up there because I was with my wife. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's the honeymoon after all. Right. Okay. <laughs> uh, you might not so, be married after you come down if you take her all the way up there on your honeymoon. Yeah, I, I, we did uh, up to the halfway. <laughs> Yeah, I was in pain. I was in pain when I came when I the next day after I hiked down. Yeah, but it's beautiful and it was very very windy, very windy. Because like I was, I was a little bit surprised that it's so windy that he can easily knock off my tripod. You know yeah. when I was there, you know uh, I was using a, a a smaller tripod, a portable tripod which you can which you can fold it, and that one is not so stable. You know, but it's good enough in 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 most situation and in cities. In city but then yeah. you know after that i upgraded my tripod so to have a tripod that more versatile to different weather condition yeah so right, you need something sturdy yeah so back to you on your presentation okay. so when i was in south korea uh, most of my time i lived in busan and busan is the second largest city it's in the south there's about three million people it's quite a big city and I think one of the things that separates Busan from Seoul is that obviously it's right on the ocean. It's a port city. And so you just have this kind of grittiness to, to it. But then you also have these really modern skyscrapers. And there's, it's also there's a lot of mountains cutting through the city. So you can get a lot of great views over the city. Um, this, this one here is at a temple. Is it called Oryok-san or something? I can't remember exactly. It's one of my favorite spots. I call this one the Big Buddha. If you look at the lantern down at the bottom, there was somebody sitting there praying. So it's just kind of like this quiet little island right in the middle of the city. These are those same buildings. It's a big one of, big. What's that? It's a big, it's for, Thanks, you can see the, the seal cloud just right above the, yeah, the sea, so, you know? The funny thing is, um, when I went to Dubai, you know Rustam, Rustam Azmi, right? Yeah, yeah, I met him. Yeah, I told him yeah. to get in touch with you. So he's from Dubai. And um, actually, before I met you, Jimmy and I went to Dubai and we were trying, one of the things we wanted to photograph was the fog. Yeah. And of course, the fog doesn't happen every day. And we didn't, it, there was a little fog on the last day, uh, but we weren't able to photograph it. We couldn't get up high and it disappeared. So when I got back to Busan, I was like, wait a minute, we have tons of fog in Busan. Why don't I just take photos of the fog in Busan? And so I kind of went on a mission. I have so many fog photos of Busan, of these buildings and, and other parts of the city. Um, the fog happens, I think, um, 
I can't remember exactly March, April, May, sometimes, sometimes July, August. It really just depends. Uh, but the fog rolls in quite often from the sea and right around these, these buildings here, the I Park Tower and, and that's the Guangan Bridge. Yeah. So another thing to look for is, and also in cityscape photography in general, is you know, to use the weather, try and look at you know, what's the weather doing in your area and try and you know, shoot something original uh, using the weather in your own city. Yeah, yeah, that would be very, very nice. It looks like it's, it's more easy to assess. You, know, you don't have to, you, know, you can, you can re repeat the shooting every day. Exactly. So yeah. we're, we're always trying, to, you, know, you see maybe some people who live in Canada and they're getting the Northern Lights all the time. And then you're like, I wanna shoot the Northern Lights. And then, but if you don't have it or you go to some place and it doesn't show up while you're there, it's kind of disappointing. So I think one of the ways that you can really develop your own photography is to try and shoot your own place where you live, your own city or your own village, town, whatever try and shoot it uh, different times of year uh, with different types of weather. And that way you can get something really original that most people don't get simply for the fact that they don't live there. They can't wait for those perfect conditions. So yes, yes, I mean, this yes. only happened a few times a year, uh, but yes. I was looking out my window every day waiting for it. So, um, so the, first, the first condition is that you have to rent a room it's a view. Yeah, <laughs> so, <exactly>. um, <laughs> so that you can monitor it every day and, and with your camera battery right. fully charged. Or, well, they have webcams now too. There's some webcams, which are, a lot of cities have webcams you can look at and see the weather. Yeah. Um, so. uh, these are some of my first, these are my first photos in Asia. These are, these two photos are from 2006, I think, end of 2006. Uh, my first one of my first places in, in Asia was Mongolia. Well, China, then Mongolia. I took these with a Canon PowerShot A610, a little five megapixel camera. It was my first digital camera. Uh, you can see the one on the left is uh, quite saturated and contrasty. Um, but um, yeah, that was like one of my first uh, landscape photos, I think. And I, the, the girl there, she was in my group. We were like rented a van and traveled around and had a driver. And uh, she just walked out there and it was just the Mongolia is really interesting because it's so empty. It's one of the least populated places on the planet. And it's just really nice to, to get out and see that. Also the people dress and live in yurts and tents. So it's like they're living the same way people lived, but like 800 years ago. Yeah. Like if you go to the museum in Ulaanbaatar, yeah. you look in the museum and they, say, they show you like, oh, these are the houses and they're tents. They're the same yurts that the people live in today, except now they have a satellite dish in them or something. So, um, and I think something like two thirds of the country is still nomadic, which is one of the only places on the planet that they're like that. So. You know, people are just moving, they move their home. So that, all of that makes it for a really, really interesting place. Uh, for landscape photography, the, the skies are super clear. So you can do great astrophotography there. There's tons of, in the, in the summer, it's green with rolling hills. It has the desert, it has lakes. It's really such a fantastic uh, country for, for photography. Yes, no and doubt. also for photographing people as well. Yeah, definitely. They have, uh... I think they have like uh, the eagle hunter, yeah. the deer hunter race uh, there also, they are living there. So this is also quite, right. quite, a, quite a popular, uh, you know, subject for photographer. Right. Are there any questions so far about any of these places? Yeah. Okay, all right. Let's say hi to some of those people on the Facebook live there. Okay. So like, you know, you know, we have like just one, Justin Kwan, I think, and Victor Dan. So good to see you here. And Acha, I'm not sure whether I pronounced the name correctly. And Taufik, okay, good to see you guys here. Taufik and also Lito, good to see you. Lito is from Philippines. And uh, I think two days ago, I just went on a talk there. 
on their they have their own philosophy society there. So it's good to see you there. Uh, we have Lee, Lee from Lee Photo. Good to see you guys here. Okay. So if you guys have any question, feel free to leave your question in the comment. We will. If you just join in, you can welcome you know Pete again by showing some love on the Facebook or some thumbs up. Okay. Yeah. You're so, a pro. Are you sure this is only your first time? You're a pro, man. Is it? <laughs> I do in copy, okay, <laughs> copying. Okay. So Bunsen, good to see you here. Okay. So I think Pete, you can just continue. I will help you monitor the the okay the the, the, the people. Yeah, here. I can't yeah. I can't see the, the Facebook or Zoom chat. So yeah. that's why you should have to monitor. Okay. Yeah. In China, so I've been all over China. I love traveling around China from Beijing to Shanghai, Qingdao. Um, I haven't been out to far Western China, uh, but for sure, um, one of the, the highlights of, for me in China is Zhang Zhajie National Park in Hunan, China. And this is where the, mm. well, Avatar, right? They, they yeah. kind of modeled the, the Avatar the movie floating off mountains. Of the floating mountains, yes. Yeah. So if you look in this photo in the bottom third, you'll see a little white thing at the bottom. That's a, that's a bus actually, just to give you an idea of how big these, these spires are. They're literally, they're, they're like um, office towers, you know, they're like skyscrapers. These things are massive. That bus is the bus which goes through the park. It takes you into inside the park. Well, well the the bus does look like you know giving me an illusion that it's actually on on the mountain, you know, but it's yeah, on oh, the okay. ground, right? But it does look like it's like you know it's like in the it's just like you know in the middle of nowhere on the mountain there. It right. does give me that kind of impression, it's, <laughs> you know. That's, that's that's very cool, you know. Zhang Jiajie is like yeah, uh, kind of famous location, and I really wish that. You know, I have so many places that I want to clear on my bucket list. So yeah, if, this, yeah, this is definitely one of the places. If yeah. you go to Zhang Zhajie and if you have the time, I highly recommend you sleep inside the park. There is a kind of plateau in the park and there are, it's like a little village. And it's not the main area where the elevator, there's a huge elevator, not that area. If you go into the park, there's a little village and they have some kind of um, home, not homestay, but... Um, what do you call it? Just kind of like a cheaper place, nothing fancy, but staying in the park is awesome. And then you can find these little trails where there's hardly any tourists and really see some unique stuff, kind of like where I took this, this shot. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice. That's nice. By the way, we have Simon join us. Simon Bond? Yeah. Hey, what's up, Simon? Yeah, good to see you, bro. <laughs> And also, uh, Bun, Lo Bun Chu say that it feels like Eastern egg in the photo. Feels yeah, like it what? It does feel like Eastern egg. Eastern egg. What's Eastern egg? Yeah, the bus, because it's like, you won't, you don't notice it on the first side. Oh, okay. Yeah, so okay. You need, after you mentioned it, only I was like looking at it. Oh, that, you know, it's like, it's hidden there. Right, right. So next to Zhang Zhajie, just uh, actually, it's very close. So if you go to Zhang Zhajie, you ha everybody goes to this mountain called Tiananmen Mountain. And on the yeah. way up, you take a cable car. This is there, it's the longest cable car ride in the world. And when you're going up in this cable car, so I shot this from the cable car. This road is called 99 Benz Road. You can either take the bus up and the cable car down or the cable car up and the bus down, but you can't do both each way as far as I know. Okay. At least you couldn't when I was there. So I took the cable car up, which I recommend, but the bus ride down was probably the scariest bus ride I've ever been on. <laughs> I mean, and every, the drivers, they do that you know, many times a day. So they go so fast because they know every one of these curves and your knuckles are white by the time. I mean, everybody's just holding on to the seats and bracing themselves as you're flying around these curves. Yeah. So at the top of the mountain, there is a famous, a very popular shot. There's like a glass walkway 
and yeah. you look straight down a cliff. It's not the glass bridge. There's another place with a glass bridge and that, that's not this. It's literally a cliff with a glass bridge on. Yeah, I saw some photos on that it's too. You know, so, it's kind of terrifying. Yeah, it's terrifying. And usually the one thing for, for a photo tip, if you go there, it's often cloudy or raining there. And yeah. my gear actually got quite um, wet because uh, even in my bag, it got, it was so humid and I got um, humidity inside my lens and it just screwed ah. everything up. But if you go there, if, I, if you really want to get a clear shot, you should look and see when is the best time of year, when it's clearest. I don't know when that is, but, but also the clouds can give you some, may give you some kind of moody image. Um, yeah like it like it did here so um yeah those are those two and then the other place last place is yeah okay, uh, before we move on i think that there's some question that oh sure yeah that, that, that i think that one of them i missed out is about the fog you know like like uh jason do you capture this in law exposure he was talking about the photos in the busan where all the fogs accumulate into a single photo is this in a single long exposure the fog photo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Busan one, the bridge. Um, this yeah, one. The, no, yes, that's one. This, uh, this is a single exposure. I, I don't, I've never done a multiple exposure for a fog. The only thing I have done for fog, which works very well, is if you use an ND filter, like a 10 stop filter, and you do a 30 or better one minute to two minute exposure, yeah. then the fog uh, gets kind of silky the same way that the clouds look silky. Yep. And you can get a really cool effect if you have fog and you know one to four minute exposure. Uh, that that's not this photo. This is blur effect there. Yes. Yeah. And it just smooths everything out. It looks so cool. Um, I, I almost put that photo in this uh, slideshow, but but yeah, so fog, I always just do a single exposure. I mean, it's either a single exposure yeah. or one long exposure. Yeah, okay, good. The next question is from Vincent. Uh, it's like on the Zhang Jiajie, I believe. He asked whether it's the, it's the shot from a drone. Do they have any restriction in using drone there? I, this isn't from a drone. This is from the, the ledge. If you look in the lower, very lower right-hand corner of this shot, you'll see a little bush which is about one meter away from me. So in Zhang Zhaze, they have all of these trails that go around the edge of these plateaus and they literally go right up to the edge. And so you can easily get up and, and get a clear shot and you're up so high, it's so um, jagged and so deep there that you can really get a shot that looks like you're shooting from a drone. I do have other photos from there that I took with my drone and I didn't have any problems using my drone. It's, it's a park. The only thing is that if you're down low, obviously maybe you can't get the satellite uh, connection if there's too many stone pillars yeah. above you. Yeah, That could be one issue. And then the other issue is I had a problem and I don't know if, if anybody else who's been to China and used the drone had this problem. So I have a DJI Mavic Pro, the, the first generation. And initially when I went to China, I had a SIM card from Hong Kong because I took the train from Hong Kong up to Guilin, which is another amazing place for photography. But anyways, um, I used my SIM card from Hong Kong and when I use my SIM card in Hong Kong, I had no issues flying my drone with the app. But after I ran out of data on my Hong Kong SIM card, I bought a Chinese SIM card, which wasn't easy to get. It was kind of complicated. And this is maybe just three years ago, I think, two, three years ago. Um, so when I bought the Chinese SIM card and turned on the DJI app, which DJI is from China, uh, the, all of the sudden, I had some restrictions on my DJI app. Like I had to re-register it and I couldn't go above 25 meters and all these other things. Eventually I was able to fix it or kind of break it or whatever. 
But I think the biggest issue flying a drone in Zhang Zhaje is not if you can fly your drone, it, um, you know, if it's easy to fly a drone, I think it's more, can you get your drone and the app to actually work and work well in China? Yeah. I don't know if that was just me, but um, that's just something to, to consider. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, another message is from Joey. He say like, try riding the bus in the north of the Philippines where you ride on top of the bus and you pass <laughs> at the edge of the cliff. Yeah. I can imagine that. Uh, yeah. yeah, that would be scary. Yeah, you know, I done that in to India. It's, yeah. it's kind of scary. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I, I so, did that in Myanmar, but not there were no cliffs. It was flat, but it was fun. Yeah, is anything wrong? You know, it was straight down. <laughs> so okay, so oh, Hong Kong this is good. Yeah. So did you go to Hong Kong yet? I, <laughs> I was planning to. Right, you know, right, supposedly. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, supposedly, like, I think last year, you yep. know, remember right. I told you last year, yeah. and then they yeah. have been having the protest. Right. So I decided to postpone, and you also postpone your, your tour there. Exactly. And then I decided to do it this year, and the <laughs> pandemic come, <laughs> came in, and uh, I don't know when. You know, I don't know when. I, I wish that, I wish that. Okay, by the way, Simon said that, me too, I did that in Myanmar. I believe he's talking about the... The, the the crazy drive you know bus trend experience right right yep so um yeah this is uh hong kong for me the two best cities in the world for cityscape photography are hong kong and dubai those are my two favorite places um i would say a third is probably singapore and new york city um, but actually Hong Kong has double the amount of skyscrapers than New York. It has the most skyscrapers in the world. It's the and most, most dense. Yes, right. it's also one of the most densely populated places in the world. And within Hong Kong, the most densely populated neighborhood, not neighborhood, but um, district or whatever, one of the most densely populated is Kowloon. And this is Kowloon and in Kowloon, there's a building right on the water. It's called the Sky 100. And the, you've probably seen photos of it before. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people don't know, but this, the, this, oh no, actually it's not called Sky 100. The building is called, I think it's, is it One Financial Center? I can't remember. Maybe if somebody knows and they can type in the chat, the name yeah. of the building. If I think it's know, can just World Trade Center or One Financial Center. Anyways, it's this massive building. But if you just Google Sky 100, it's the observatory at the top of that building. And a lot of people don't know about this, this observatory, but there's a fantastic view from up there because you look over to Hong Kong Island and you get a, a great, great views. But if you shoot down, you can shoot down into Kowloon and that's where I got this shot. Uh, this was a, a shot with a telephoto, I think at about 80 millimeters on a full frame. This is a single exposure. And a lot of people, I think when you do landscapes and even cityscapes, most of the time landscape photographers use a wide angle lens, but you can actually get some really interesting images using a telephoto lens. Yeah, I think it's very cool, you know, because like, uh, I think one of my friends, uh, Vin Wilson, you know, he put his new name like Di Dino. Mm -hmm. I say that also in shot, I thought it was volcano and lava from far. You know, this photo does give, does give me such an impression. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, Volcano lava. It's very really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that, I was kind of going for something like I actually I saw you did an article about tone the color tones. Yeah. 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 So yeah, I tried to use either complementary tones or just like a single tone. I think you can get some really interesting looking images, and obviously these well maybe not so obvious but these streets here, they're not that orange. So what I did was I went into Lightroom and in Lightroom, you can use the hue saturation luminance panel. And if you go under hue, so usually the street lights are either kind of more orange or yellowish, and you can kind of change the hue around and then brighten, brighten it or lower it. 
So that's one kind of trick. If you want to get your really control the color, a lot of people just go to the saturation or the luminance, but you can also have a big effect by moving the hue channel. And you can do that in, in Lightroom very easily. Yeah, so that's one, one of the tricks from Pig, you know, on how to use the Lightroom to do the, to make the adjustment to the color. And one last little thing, uh, leave out the sky. That can also give people the impression that it's endless. So you by by a lot of times people always include the sky, especially in landscapes, but also in cityscapes. And one little trick is rather than showing the sky, don't show the sky, purposely leave it out because it makes the viewer wonder what's beyond the edge. This these buildings could seemingly go on forever. You know, we don't know where it ends. But if you show the sky, then you give an ending to the story. You know where that ends. So sometimes by not showing everything, you actually make people think about more about what the scene is about, what the composition is about. Yeah, agree. Agree with that. Next, right next to Hong Kong, we have Macau. And in Macau, this is a kind of famous place or thing to, to photograph in Macau. This is called the Lisbo Lisboa Grand Hotel. And I, I love this shot because you have the contrast between the old and the new. And that's one of the things that I try and do in my cityscape photography is try and shoot using themes or uh, stories. You hear a lot of people say like, what's the story in an image? And with yeah. cityscape photography, it's more difficult because cityscapes are pretty much just concrete and steel. And it's, you know, what's the story in there? How can I make that original? Or how can I make it say something? And one of the, the common themes I like to use is the old and the new. And this is a perfect example of that. You have these kind of old um, houses, apartments yes. against this futuristic a tower in the background. So there's some other stuff to, to photograph in Macau as well, but this is definitely one of my favorite spots. And if you go to Hong Kong, you can take a ferry to Macau. It's about one hour. I think it costs 10, I can't remember exactly, 10 US one way or it's 20 US round trip or something like that. Yeah. But definitely if you're in Hong Kong, you gotta, even if you just go for a day, um, make it happen. Yeah, I think it's cool, you know, it's like, it's like, it's not just like new and old. It's also something like, you know, the building at the back there is like huge, it's so futuristic. It look like, you know, a scene from a scientific movie, scientific right. movie. You right. know, it's like, it's like the, the town, the city got invaded by some sort of like spaceship, something right. like that. It does, exactly. yeah, it does give people this kind of like feeling. You know, it's very cool, I like that. But by the way, this is also another telephoto shot. This is with a, I think I was maybe at a hundred, I can't remember exactly, 100, 150 millimeters. So again, you know, don't just use that wide angle lens, break out a, a telephoto and really zoom in on a, on a piece. Try and find a small scene within the larger scene and really pick something unique out of it. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes telephoto does give you something it's like different perspective and you also give you the lens compression effect. Exactly. So, like, That's really important. Right. All right. The next spot in, that I love in Asia, Singapore. Singapore is just an incredible city. And what I like about Singapore is that it has a kind of futuristic feel to it, some parts of it, um, especially the Marina Bay Sands in the downtown area. So this part, uh, this one on the left, this is the Marina Bay Sands and that building with the SG on it, that's the Science Museum of Science. And there was a full moon uh, at the start of September. And I just used uh, photo pills and planned out where the moon was going to rise. And I thought that would make a good location. It, it kind of looks like a hand and there's like something rising from the hand or, or whatever. So. It does look that, like, you know, like, you know, like the Buddha statue, you know, the Buddha hand is like holding. Right, you know, right. Like it's something. a lotus actually. They call yeah, it the lotus, lotus building. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Uh, 
Someone asked a question. I believe that you're going to answer that. It's on the right photo. Can you get me viewing in Singapore? Say again. Can you Where get can you viewing in Singapore? Where can you get this view? You, know, you mentioned about can you get new keyway in Singapore? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say that. So for me, um, you, I like, I do composites sometimes, not often, but I do like to do composite photography. I also like to do mirror images. And so this photo is, that Milky Way is a composite. The Milky Way is actually, I think from Penang, it's not from, um, it's, it's from Singapore. From Malaysia. You can, you, you can't really see or photograph the Milky Way in Singapore. I, I read somewhere, I, somebody did it, or I mean, it's, it's possible to do, but the quality is not very good because there's too much light pollution. So anytime you see a very solid, rich, strong Milky Way shot over any major city, it's most likely a composite. Uh, for those who don't know what a composite is, it's basically when you take two photographs or more and you put other parts of a photograph you mix them, it's kind of like a puzzle. So you take one piece of one photograph and then overlay it uh, with another picture. Or some people say, is that Photoshopped? Yes, you use Photoshop to do that. Yeah. Also, the shot on the right, that building, so obviously that's a mirror image. The photo on the left, uh, I actually, I can't even remember. I think it's the photo on the left is the original. And the photo on the right is a mirror image of the left. The reason I did that is that I love that, that circular building right in the middle of the photo. And that's really what caught my eye about this photo. That building is the Supreme Court of Singapore. Mm -hmm. And it looks like a UFO. It's the, it's the strangest building I've ever seen. I mean, it's just unlike any building you've ever seen. Exactly. And, and, and if you... Well, the participants ahead. reply that, you know, uh, just they say that it looks like a space, a space city, a right. space city. So it's, it is, it's very cool, you know? Right. So for me, when my, that, the kind of anchor or main point of this image for me was that, that roof, that, or that building, the spaceship. And it was like a UFO. And the interesting thing that, you know, it's a circle. So if I mirror it, it's going to make a complete circle, which is actually exactly what it looks like. Even though I mirrored it, it still looks the same. And I thought it looked like a spaceship. And I said, oh, well, if this is a UFO, if this is a spaceship, then we need to be in space. You know, this is like uh, spaceship Singapore or something like that. And that's why I put the, the Milky Way behind it. Now, Yes, it's a composite image, but actually, if we didn't have light pollution, we would see the Milky Way over our, the city. So it's there, maybe not in this direction like this, but the Milky Way is there. We just can't see it with our eyes because there's too much light pollution. And also it's cloudy quite a, quite a bit. Yeah, here. for me, it's okay, you know, for for an uh, imposite photo, because like it's an app, you know, we don't just press the shutter button, you know, Process right. it into, it's yeah. you could call it digital art. So I, yeah. I like to do a bit of both. Yeah, yeah, cute. Yeah. Angkor Wat, um, you know, this is a super popular spot, kind of iconic style photo. Angkor Wat, if you if you're traveling around Asia, for sure, the biggest temple complex, without a doubt, uh, for me is is Angkor Wat. The two best temples for me in Asia, temple complexes, are Bagan, Myanmar and Angkor Wat. Um, Angkor Wat's so impressive. Uh, there are a lot of tourists there, whereas Bagan is, you know, has a lot of small little temples. You can kind of go off on your own, explore. It's a totally different feeling. But if you're in Asia, you have to go to at least either Angkor Wat or Bagan in Myanmar. Yeah, I, this is so what the destination. Okay, I keep saying, I keep repeating the same symptoms. Like, <laughs> you've been to so many places that I yet to, <laughs> Yet to visit, and you know, guess what, guys? Just like to let you know that because we now is having this pandemic, and we can't travel around the world. And Pete is like bringing you guys around, like on a tour, virtually on this 
Zoom meeting on this Facebook Live. So we are traveling around the Asia. Okay. So yeah, we're too cool. So <laughs> if you guys enjoy that, let me know, leave a comment there, or maybe you know, just 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 social some actions. Okay. You could or or like this and and send some love, give it a heart. Yeah. <laughs> like you said earlier. <laughs> yeah, send some love here. Okay. Um, <laughs> um this this photo by the way if you've never been here this is one of those places that when you go in the morning there are 10,000 photographers there like yeah. you're shoulder to shoulder crazy it's in the the pond the lake is is quite small sometimes it's like kind of dried up i mean you have to get there at like 4 a.m there's just an insane number of 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 people there so yeah any questions so far? So far, no, but I mean, at Wing Un, he wants a free hug from you, or would you hug maybe? <laughs> a pizza? <laughs> here's, the, here's the heart. Yeah, the heart. Okay, good. So how many places that you guys have been to that Pete has shared so far, you know? So if you have some places that you've been to, maybe you can just leave a comment there, just tell us, you know, say your story here. Yeah. All right. So for those of you um, who guessed at the beginning, this is the Tiger Cave Temple in Krabi. Uh, that I love the area, the southern part of Thailand around um, the Andaman Sea. So north of Langkawi Island, going up to uh, Phuket, Koh Phi Phi, Krabi, that whole area is really beautiful. And this is just outside of Krabi. This is the Tiger Temple. There's like 1,200 steps to go up here. If you're wondering, I did not climb them. This is the first time I realized how lazy having a drone has made me. Because <laughs> back in the day when I didn't have a drone, I would always hike up everywhere or try and get to the top of a building or a mountain. And ever since I got a drone, like, if I know sunset is at 7 p.m., I just show up at 6.30, shoot my drone up into the air, take a few shots, and then leave. Um, yeah. No, I, I spend a little more time. But when I saw this, I was, I, we got there later in the day, and I was like, I'm not going to hike up that. So, And the shot I wanted was if I was on the, the mountain itself, I couldn't have got the shot because I wouldn't get the temple, you know, the, the impressive thing is that the temple's on the top of this hill. Yeah, it's really cool. Another beautiful place in Thailand, Koh Phangy. Um, this is a little fishing village uh, right in, yeah, north of Phuket, not too far from Phuket. Very interesting little place. And is that a floating village? Yeah, floating village. It's a Muslim village, like Muslim uh, fishermen. You can see there's a mosque just in front of the oh, yeah. mountain. Um, and then in front of the mosque, in the kind of middle, there's a soccer field and a basketball court. That's a school. Seriously, you know, it's like it's, you know, it's like quite a small town. You know, it's right, like right. not oh, really. It's, it's a total. It's a total town. Uh, actually, though. This is a huge tourist attraction and there's a ton of boats coming through here. So a lot of those, if you look on the right hand side, you'll see a bunch of um, places for boats to dock. And yeah. those long buildings with the blue and the, the reddish roofs and green, those are restaurants. And then inside from there, there's also, you can buy like scarves and trinkets. So it's a real town, people are living there, but I think it got much bigger simply for the fact that so many tourists visit there. You can do boat trips from Phuket or Koh Phi Phi, I think. You can take a boat uh, maybe two hours or something. Yeah. And you're there. So a very, very cool, interesting place. Yes, yes. This yeah. is a drone drone shot, obviously. This is a drone <laughs> panorama, maybe four, 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 expo four shots stitched together, I think, four or five. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, another, now we are at the Vietnam. Yeah, so I, another place I really like, my, my favorite little village in Vietnam is Hoi An. Actually, it's just one of my favorite places in all of Asia. I, I love Hoi An. It's, it's very chill. It's small. 
the it's a beautiful little town. There are a ton of tourists there, though. That is the one kind of downside to it. But I still think even if you stay just a few kilometers outside of the city center, you can find a nice, quiet place, very chill, eat some good food. And if you wake up early in the morning, like I did for this shot, you can see the the town before you know it's filled with with people with tourists so most people go to da nang they fly into da nang and then they stay in da nang a lot of the tour buses they stay in da nang and they bus them up it's about an hour drive for half hour 45 minutes they walk around hoi an in the afternoon and evening and then leave so in the morning it's quite empty it's beautiful you know you have a very amazing sunrise here and the colors you know it's really awesome you know and yeah. the birds yeah, yeah those yeah. are the boats they take you out um yeah. at night you you get lantern there's like lanterns floating in the water it's very beautiful very picturesque place and if you like street photography there's a, a great little market there's also a lot of just tourists and and this you can have a field day here just taking street photos it's it's very picturesque yellow walls i mean it's an idyllic little uh town that's good okay uh Oh, I believe most Malaysia will recognize this place. Right. So, so you're the Bromo master. Uh, <laughs> Not really. Okay. How many of you have been to this place? You know, if you have been there, yeah, you know, I'm just curious. Yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, S. C. Lee, you know, he left a comment there. He said that the world is so big and so little time and money to travel all location. I know. I know. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm it's showing a, you. These photos are over 2006, 2020. This is like 14 years of travel. Yeah. It's yeah. not like I just did all this in a, even a year or two. I mean, this is... Um, Nobody can be that rich to travel, you know, all the time. But also in, you know, I think you, you guys are so lucky here in Southeast Asia, especially in Malaysia because you have such a central, you're so centrally located, uh, you could fly to incredible places within two hours. Most of these places, a lot of them are like a two to three hour flight. And, you know, if you take Air Asia, the Air Asia these days has, if you get your tickets early, you can get some pretty cheap flights. Um, but yeah, it's true, uh, time and money. Yeah, and by the way, Jason asked, do you travel alone while photographing or with people around or with you never know, like traveling in a group or, you know, it's a, alone? it's a combination. I, I think most of the time I travel with someone, but I do travel alone. Sometimes the traveling with other people is great because first, obviously uh, you have friends and you can hang out and mm -hmm. it's not boring. Yeah. But a good thing about traveling with friends and photography is that even if you travel with one other person, everything is 50% cheaper. Definitely. If you get a guide, it's, you know, not always, but, you know, you can, it's cheaper to split the cost of a double room usually than getting a single room by yourself. Or if you want to hire a guide and a driver, if you have three people, then you can, usually the cost is a fixed cost and then you can divide it by three people. So besides having somebody to just hang out with and have fun with, you can also uh, lower your costs and it is, can be safer depending on where you're traveling, especially with photography. A lot of times we are out, you know, before sunrise or after sunset, especially in some cities, you might be in a place that most people don't go. Yeah. And if you have some other people with you, it can be safer. You're carrying expensive gear. Uh, but I do like being by myself sometimes. I feel like when I'm alone, I can really kind of zen out and just focus on what I'm doing. And it's I'm really 100% focused on my own photography. And also when you travel alone, you open up yourself more to strangers. Your strangers are more likely to approach you when you're alone. So, you know, maybe you're sitting alone in some restaurant and then some people will start talking to you or, you know, somebody will offer you a ride somewhere or whatever. So it, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jason, he has another question. Okay, but 
I think that I can help you to answer that, but let me just say it out here. So let's say you're traveling with others, known photographers, how do you deal with other people who are not photographers? Seeing it usually takes a while to get a good shot. Okay. Yeah, actually. It's... Are you talking about your wife or girlfriend? <laughs> yes, he's, he's, he's referring his wife actually. <laughs> and my advice is that you don't go take photos <laughs> with your wife right. <laughs> right. or with known photographer, okay? Right. If you, you know, if you, on a trip with, with your partner, then let them rest in the hotel, okay? Or just, you know, just let them spend right. their time in shopping mall or any things, okay? A price you can pass your credit card to her. <laughs> <laughs> that could get pretty expensive. Okay. Yeah, the, yeah. I think the one thing is you either have to wake up really early or stay out later. So if you, you know, you get up before sunrise and then, you know, you can go off on your own. Maybe you have children or, or whatever. It can be hard to kind of go away and, and just have some time on your own. So if you go while they're sleeping, that could be one thing. So sunrise or something. Also, I love night photography. And one of the great things about night photography is that you can, it happens every day and you just go out in the evening. So uh, at nighttime, maybe, you know, say 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 9 p.m., when your, your family or your partner is resting, watching TV, you say, hey, I'm just going to go out for an hour and walk around the city or the neighborhood or, or try and go out and shoot, you know, maybe the sunset or something. Yeah, it's important to, you know, like, you know, like, how to say, schedule your time, manage your time, you know. You need to have time that you focus on your family, your friend, and then you only, have, only you have your own time for your photography. I, I will say, though, that I, I would, if, if you can, to try and schedule time for yourself. And I know maybe this sounds a little bit selfish, but I think we, photography is a, is, a, is a hobby. It's a great hobby. And it's kind of a release, like a stress release. So you forget about your job. Yeah. You forget about any maybe fights that you're having with, with your partner, friends, or family. And it gives you a chance to be creative, which is something that we don't do that often it's it's like if you play an instrument or if you play a sport or something it just helps you to forget about you know the everyday life and just kind of do something that you love and this is a really important thing i think it's a, like a prior it should be a priority in everyone's life to try and at least in my mind I'd set some time aside to do these sort of things and if you can there's nothing better i think than going with a group of friends or even going on a, a tour or something like that, because you get to spend, you know, one day, three days, five days, seven days with a group of people who are crazy passionate about waking up early and sitting on a mountaintop waiting for sunrise yes. or traveling around the city. Like it's such a, um, it's something that doesn't normally happen. And when you can, get in a group of people like that, you can, I think it really helps your photography as well, so. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, very unique experience if you hang out with a group of people that share the same right. uh, hobby, you know, uh, you know, you have, it's totally unique, you know, you can do something that you won't usually do, I would say. Right. You know, like staying out in the late night or staying alone, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Just look at those kind of crazy things. Okay, I, I mean photography. I mean well, like well, staying up until three a.m. drinking beer. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I believe that you guys may have attended any like photography tour or like going on a trip with photographers friend. You know, if you have some experience, you can let us know here by sharing in the chat room or the comment there too. You know. Yeah. Okay. So back. To All right. You. I'm gonna. I'm going to jump back to this, these photos here. So this yeah. is Mount Bromo. All of you know, or not all of you, but for those of you who live in Malaysia or Southeast Asia, I'm sure you've heard of Mount Bromo. If you haven't, it's definitely one of the most um, incredible places I've seen in Southeast Asia. It has a landscape unlike anything you've ever seen with these volcanoes. Yeah. And a lot of people go there, myself included, to shoot the Milky Way. And you lead some tours there, right? Um, ciao. Yes, yes, there are a lot of tourists. Uh, I've no, I mean, tours, you, lead, yeah. uh, you do the Milky Way tour in yeah. uh, Bromo. I, so, I've been there quite 
many times. I yeah, remember. I asked you, I actually contacted you for, for tips about shooting there. And yeah. so I went there for three days. If you go, you should stay at least three days if you want to shoot the Milky Way. All three days, it was cloudy and I was really disappointed. But instead, I flew my drone over uh, the volcano, which was really cool. If you look down, you can see these little things that look like ants in the bottom middle. Those are actually uh, people in cars. Yes. Or cars, yeah. And then there's like a straight line going up to the, the, the lip, the edge there. And you can hike up to the edge of the volcano, which I don't understand because if that thing blows, like you're, you're gone. It's an empty volcano. You yeah, know? yeah. I mean, there's not much smoke coming out at that yeah. time, but yeah, crazy. Well, it's like almost every year that you know you, you often hear the news that you know it's exploding thing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's quite common here. Yeah. So also in Indonesia, not too far, relatively speaking, uh, from from Surabaya is where you fly in to go to Bromo, right? Surabaya. Yes. Yes. So just across is is Bali. Yes. And I don't know about you, but I didn't really find Bali that interesting for kind of landscape photography. There's some interesting things there, but nothing that was really, I don't know. It's it, it was nice, but I wasn't really thrilled with it. Yeah, maybe, maybe just, because like too too many trees, I guess. Yeah. Um, but one place I did really like is Nongalan Beach. You, there's this shipwreck there and you can, it's facing in the right direction to get the Milky Way. This is the, one of the first shots I did, I think, where I timed, you know, I, I checked on photo pills to make sure the, the Milky Way was running, you know, uh, straight up and down. And I knew exactly the time. And I had this kind of vision in my head of the, the composition that I wanted. So yeah, I'm not a huge fan of Bali for, for photography, although I can't say I've traveled all over it. Uh, but I wanted to include this photo in here because I know you're the, the Milky Way Sifu. And this is one of my, my favorite Milky Way <laughs> shots. So I yeah. had to put this in here because I'm talking to you. Um, but the place that I do love for landscape photography, and I think not as many people know about, is there's an island that's about a one hour boat ride from Bali called Nusa Penida Island. Yes. yes. And it's amazing. And actually in the last maybe three or four years, it's gotten quite popular because there's one beach called, or, yeah, beach called Clanking Beach. And it has this kind of, I don't know how to explain it, this kind of little thing jutting out into the water, like a, a ridge. And they have an ash there, right? Is that What's one? that? It's like, it's like they have a cliff extender out and the arch there at the bottom. Yes, yes yeah, the it's all yeah, over. I saw that. It's yeah, all I over Instagram. That. And to the, the next to that, uh, uh, maybe a kilometer away is there's a circular, oh, the one with the arch, that's the other one. Yes, there's a bay with an arch and yeah. the water going out. And that's very cool too. Um, but on the other side of the island, there's also this place. There's a whole bunch of stuff, but I love Nusa Penida Island. Um, it's just has this raw prehistorical kind of feel to it so different than bali and it's not that developed at least it wasn't when i was there two two three years ago although i'm sure it's changed but it's it's very very cool so if you ever go to bali and you're looking to do more photography if you can check out nusa panita island spend you know two three nights there and last last country we're going to end is uh is malaysia so um, I've lived in Malaysia for a while. I love Penang. Of course, everybody, if you're from Malaysia or have been there, you know Penang as the place with the street art and street photography, and it has all that. It's incredible. But the thing that I actually like most about Penang is photographing the weather. So in Penang, you have these incredible sunrises and sunsets. I don't know what it is. I've never lived in a place with so many beautiful sunsets that happens so often. I don't know if it's because it's right on the ocean or the geography or what, but they have the most incredible sunsets there. All the sky is just full of color. It's not rare to see just a, you know, the sky on fire. So yeah. 
I love the sunsets in Penang. Also, um, Malaysia has, I was reading Malaysia has more lightning strikes than almost any country in the world. Yes, yes, I've, yeah, I read I've that I've never too. seen, I've never lived in a place with so much lightning. Like it's, and so big and so loud. And so I, I started photographing lightning there. And of course you wanna be in a protected area. This is the photo on the right is from Penang shooting over towards Butterworth with a telephoto lens. This is a composite image. So it's actually two photos. There's two different strikes with two different exposures. They're each maybe 30 second exposures. And then I just blended them together in Photoshop using blend mode lighten. I don't use a lightning trigger. I just do a 30 second or one minute exposure. And I just keep hitting the, the shutter. I use a trigger release. And I just, it's kind of like fishing. You do it for, you know, 30 seconds at a time. And then you just hope that some lightning will strike during that 30 seconds. So you take maybe 30 photos, 30 seconds each. And then a few of those will have lightning strikes in them. Yes, it's not yes. that hard to, to capture. And at nighttime, you don't need an ND filter or anything like that. You just, you know, can shoot it without a filter. Yeah, yeah. So. In uh, Malaysia is often have like mostly cloudy. So I read that article too. I mean, I'm, I was, you know, I was kind of surprised when I found that. And it's true actually. That's why, uh, to be honest, if you are into astrophotography in Malaysia, you know how hard it is oh, to, yeah, right. to get a clear weather here. It's so cloudy, yeah. But, <laughs> I mean, it's, but it's also very, it's, it, it changes though. Like it could be clear in the daytime, blue sky, and then all of a sudden huge clouds, you know? Yes. Um, but in the evening, it's often, you have a lot of clouds. Sometimes we only have like 15 minutes time to, to get a shot. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, then right. you have to try again. You know, that's, that's is very common in Malaysia. And that's why Malaysia also have a lot of mount lighting strike, lightning strike here and yeah. So Lucas mentioned about trying to photographing lightning from high rise building in Subanjaya. That's interesting because I never know that Subanjaya has the most lightning in Malaysia. Oh, really? I don't know that that's first time I heard about Just, that. Yeah. My only advice is don't stand on the <laughs> top of the, don't stay on the roof when you photograph the lightning. Yeah. You have to be inside like in an apartment or, or you know. Yeah. By the way, Lito, uh, on Facebook Live, Lito say that we'll be going to Penang, you know, and get, uh, I, I think your photo make them want to go to Penang. Oh, and, cool. Yeah, go on, well, this go sunrise. Okay, yeah, yeah, it's very nice to have sunrise in Penang there, yeah. Yes, uh, sunrise in Penang, you can shoot from the old town because the sun rises over Butterworth. So it's very easy to shoot to sunrise. You can do that from, from Georgetown, however, shooting sunset you have to go to the north side of the island and it sets towards Batu Ferengi depending on the yeah. time of year so if you go to Batu Ferengi beach that could be a nice place to get the sunset although it depends on the time of year half the year it doesn't set over the ocean uh, but the sunrise is, is very easy to get. If you're going to Penang, I recommend joining a group on Facebook called Sun Seekers. Yeah, they, have, the they meet every Saturday morning. They're a great group of guys there and super nice people. And they meet up every Saturday morning. And even if you don't meet up for a sunrise shoot, you can just look at the photos on there. They have a lot of sunrise photos and you can get some ideas from yeah. there. So talk about Malaysia, you know, talk about Penang, other than photography, the food. Don't forget about the food. <laughs> and the food. Yeah, the chow kway teow, you know, and Penang prawn noodle, <laughs> roja, so many delicious food here, okay? So by the way, Raymond, why can't you say hello, Pete? Hey, Raymond, what's up, bro? Yeah. Raymond lives in um, Penang and he was actually the first person I met in Penang. So I, the first time I went to Penang was in 2015 uh, with Jimmy. That's when yeah. I met you and we yeah. went up to Penang and he took us to the, the famous, what's it called? Um, the, the jetty, Dove jetty. Dove jetty. And yeah. And, he, and then he took us out. I still remember he took us, we went for breakfast and we, we ate like 
the shrimp, um, the shrimp, char kway tiao. Yeah, the fellow is stuff. the perfect guy for food. Oh yeah, he's yeah, he knows everything about food. He does a like food blogging too, or or, or something. Yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I found the fucking yeah. when I whenever I'm in Penang. Exactly, and then he took us to a place to get bagels with salmon, and they uh, were so good for breakfast. It was so good. So yeah, um, another place I love in Malaysia is Bowie Dulong Island. This is in Sabah, Malaysian Borneo. This yeah. is one of this is the first panorama I ever did, and it's also in HDR. You can see it's kind of bad. It looks a little overexposed, and if you look at the if you look at the horizon line, it's all warped. If you notice, it kind of it looks almost like a wave because I I didn't know what I was doing. Um, this photo is from I think 2015. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, this Bowie Dulong, that area, that circle is actually a volcano. So those islands were, the, if you can imagine, the ridge of a volcano with a crater. That was, uh, this is like a sunken volcanic crater. And if you go to this island, you have to take a boat out there. You can rent the boat, and I think there's tours. And then you go up to the top, and there's this lookout. It's... Um, really easy to, to get up there. There's also some little villages around there, floating villages with the uh, Bai Zhao Lao. Also near there is the uh, Sipadan and Mabul, Mabul Island. Yeah. Some just incredible, there's great scuba diving there, snorkeling, even just snorkeling off the jetty at Mabul Island is amazing. If you go there, you fly in, you go, I went to Saba which is a, a cool little city, and then went over to Tuau, and then flew to Tuau, and then we stayed in Semporna. Uh, that's where we started, and you take a boat from Semporna to go yes. out. There's like a national park with all these islands. So this Malaysian Borneo um, is a, just an incredible place to explore. So much nature, so green. I, I still haven't been to Sarawak. I really want to go there. Um, so yeah, so, so many places to see so little time for money. Yeah. Oh, right. I remember these. Yeah. This, I think I have just one more photo after this and then I'm done. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, well, Cameron Highlands, this is in Malaysia. I took this with you and it, actually we went to photograph the Milky Way and of course there were clouds. Yeah. I think there were like no clouds for like two minutes and we could get like a few shots. Yeah. And then we, and then we, you know, stopped. And then you, you had just gotten your first light uh, painting. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. I was using a light painting too. Yeah. And that know? was like the first time you started doing light painting. And then I saw you doing it like on your, on your photo tours, I think, and other things. And you, yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, this was like, so that night, I remember I was just like, I was just done and I just slept in the car and then uh, right before sunrise woke up and then popped my drone up and there was just this incredible, uh, these clouds and they actually flew towards my drone and I have a few other photos, but I, for whatever reason, I ended up using this one, mm -hmm. but I have one with some clouds just right next to the drone. It was awesome. Uh, just really cool. So yeah, Cameron Highlands is another place. And last but not least, to finish it up, Kuala Lumpur. I love Kuala Lumpur. I haven't been up to Petronas Towers yet. My favorite spot in Kuala Lumpur to explore is Kampung Baru. Yeah. I, did a I did a video, I have a YouTube video um, on my YouTube channel about Kampung Baru. I photographed like an old house with the Petronas Towers in the background. And it's kind of funny because a lot of Malaysians are, are commenting on that video. Um, it's, they're like, oh, I'm glad you came here and that's cool. And I went into a house there, just ran some guy, random guy's house and started talking to him. So, but yeah, the, this is um, the Petronas Towers with a drone. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's the, the most iconic. A uh, landmark in Malaysia. Yep. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. Is anybody still there?
Yeah, I think everyone's still here and we still have yeah, I can't like, see anybody's pictures. Now I now I can see everybody's. So. Yeah, yeah. Is that that's the thing about like you know like having an online sharing session? You know, that's why it's, oh. it's so guys on the Zoom meeting, if you guys want, you can turn on your video, but make sure you put the clothes on before you turn your video on so that you know people can see you guys' face here. Okay. So uh we still have like you know 48 people watching, you know, concurrently on Facebook Live. Yeah. So, oh, so uh, I see one comment from Vincent. He says, "Volcano crater would be cool if you flew your drone up high and shoot the whole crater outline from the top." Something tour ended so fast. I don't know which volcano crater, if that's the Bowie Dulong one, but the yeah. or, or if that's the the yeah Bowie Dulong one he mentioned. Oh, uh, okay. Because I did fly my so I didn't have a drone when I went to Bowie Dulong. That was before I had a drone. That would be cool. I did fly my drone uh, directly over the volcano at um, uh, in Indonesia. What's it called? Um, Bromo. Bromo. The, the photo I showed you, I actually have another one where I went over the lip. I, I was just so curious. I wanted to know, like, you know, what's when you're a kid, you want to know, like, what's what does it look like in there? So. I flew my drone literally over the volcano and I was, my heart was beating so fast. I, I had only had my drone for maybe half a year or a year. I don't know. But if, if for anyone who owns a drone, you know, it, it can be very nerve wracking and stressful because you don't want to lose your drone. Cause if you do, you lose a lot of money. Yeah. And so I was flying over the volcano. I was so scared cause I was like looking into the volcano and then Right as I was doing that, my battery was at the low level. <laughs> and there's a, if anyone who has a DJI drone, you know, when the battery alarm is so loud and it freaked me out. Like I thought the volcano was going to explode or something. I just, I like jumped back. I, 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 it took me off guard. So, um, what, what gear do you carry when traveling? I am um, says Joey. Um, oh, Edwin flew above Bromo crater. Awesome. Um, what, what gear do I use when traveling? I take, um, I take one travel tripod. I have a, a, a compact, oh, I would show you, but my camera's on it right now. <laughs> You're I using a, the camera to do the, the, the video recording. Right. I have a, a photo pro, uh, carbon, uh, tripod. Uh, it's about 230 us dollars. It's, it's not expensive as tripods go, but it's a, one of those compact and it folds in on itself. So I don't carry a huge tripod. I have a smallish light tripod. It's about two kilos. And I take two lenses. Usually I just take a, a 16 to 35 that's for full frame. And I take a 28 to 300. Uh, I'm probably going to change that to a 70 to 200 or, or something. But anyways, I take two lenses a wide and a telephoto. I also sometimes take my drone depending on where I'm going. And yeah, a few shorts, a few shirts, a few pairs of underwear. <laughs> and that's about it. Okay, yeah. So I try to travel as light as possible. I mean, I don't I don't like carrying around a lot of luggage and also I try to get like the take one carry on bag on air Asia and like not do the check-in thing, you know, cause it's cheaper. So I just try and just go as light as I can. Yeah. So, um, I think that's the sharing part from me. Uh, hey, I have a question I want to ask you, you know, um, so what's the next move for you? Cause you know, now we are having this pandemic and this pandemic, pandemic have heavily impacted everyone, regardless who you are, whether are you a photographer or non-photographer. So how this changed your way of business in photography or changed the way of your, you know, uh, whatever you are doing now and what are you planning to do next? How about you share that to, to everyone here? So okay, that you want sure, to get yeah. some insight from that. Yeah, that's a good question. As far as taking photographs, I don't, you know, you might get the impression that I'm always traveling all over the world and stuff, but actually I'm not. I, I take just a few few trips a year. These are trips that I've done over many years, as I said before. 
so yeah, now that I'm not traveling, I was trying to organize some photo tours, but they got canceled. So basically um, the way I make my living is through, I, I don't sell my photos. Usually I used to do that like stock photography or try to get published, you know, write articles for magazines. I did that many years ago and then I stopped. And then I just focused on education and uh, workshops, tours, that sort of thing. We, we tried to do a tour in Hong Kong. Then there was the, the protests that got canceled. We tried yeah. to do one in France uh, last summer. Then there was COVID that got canceled. So now I think I'm really change, trying to do more stuff online, which I think most people are as well, because that's really all we can do right now. Um, and so I do, basically I do some live workshops over Zoom. Sometimes those are one day or two day workshops, or I mean, you know, a few hours, whatever. I also run an online school. It's a, it's a, like a community landscape or outdoor photography community that I run online. And we do, you know, every, every month we have two live Q and A sessions. I also invite guest experts to come and talk and teach. Simon did one of them a while back. Maybe you could come and do one. Great, if you can. Yeah, you know, that would be an honor for me. Okay, awesome, man. Um, and then, so that's really my my main focus uh, at the moment is just doing more, more things online. I, I think even without COVID, I think people want to connect. And this is, a, it's not the same as meeting up in person, but sometimes even if you can meet up in person, you don't have the time to travel or you can't travel all the way to meet those people. So yeah, basically to answer your question, just trying to move my business more online, do more, more stuff online. Yeah, it's the same, same to me here. So you know, I usually I did those like workshop offline and the pandemic. Now we have the pandemic and I, I move everything online now and focus more online. I have people requested for offline workshop, you know, because still some, there are still some people that prefer that, but then, you know, it's like, you can't make it now because like, I didn't plan that, which I'm glad that I didn't do it because now we're having another lockdown again. <laughs> well, right. it's like conditional lockdown. Well, well, I think it's a good choice to focus more online because if you have the online, you have the community, people can get connected easily regardless of where you are. You like now we have people from Philippines, Malaysia, and many other countries here. And you can always bet on offline anytime later after the pandemic, you know. Uh, Vincent asks, uh, where am I based? So I've been based in Penang, but actually now I'm in Singapore. Yeah. So now let's open the question to the floor. Uh, anyone have has any question you want to ask me? You know, just some people ask about the camera gears and some people ask about like photography tips and tricks. So anything you want to ask can ask. You can leave a comment here or if you want to unmute your mic, you can do it now. So let's see. Joey, Joey was asking if I'm in Singapore now. Yep, I'm I'm broadcasting live from Singapore, not not from uh, Kyoto, uh, as it looks here. But yeah, yeah, I'm in Singapore. I'm from New Zealand. Yeah. <laughs> and this one guy, Erwin, is from Bromo. Is that Bromo? I was gonna say, I love that. Yeah, shot. that's the Bromo. That... He's from the the what's it called? I oh, said the back behind Bromo there, the anger. Okay. Ivana or what, what, something like that. Yeah, Joey, Joey says he's in Singapore. Yeah, if anybody wants to meet up in Singapore, just send me a shout. I, I'd love to make some little meetup sometime. But of course, in Singapore, we can't meet more than five people. So it'd be a pretty small group, but maybe we could meet, meet sometime. Yeah, okay. So uh, I saw oh. one question from Thomas Young on Facebook Live there. How do you guys get connected with other photographers? How do I get connected? For me, I just, that's a good question. 
for me, the number one thing is groups, like Facebook groups, local groups, and then people know other people usually. So I think the first thing for me is the people who are in my local community, uh, my local group. Uh, Gray, I know you have a, a Facebook group and, and yeah. you do meetups from time to time. Uh, but if I'm going somewhere else, you know, maybe you see a photo uh, on social media or something, and then you direct message the photographer. That can be tricky. You have to be kind of uh, tactful if you're just like, hey, bro, where'd you shoot that? Can you give me the address? You know, some some people get pissed off. <laughs> but usually if you're if you do it in a nice way, sometimes people will share information. But the, the, the best way I meet other photographers is definitely through through either Facebook groups, social media, and then just through friends. Once you start to get to know a few photographers, uh, like I know Gray, and I'm sure if I went to Indonesia, I'm like, hey, what's who's the photographer down there? Or do you know a guide or, or something like that? And you yeah. did share that with me. So yeah. you kind of gradually get to know them. Yeah, likewise. I, I would start locally, just try and get try to meet people in your local community. For me, that's the number one thing, because those are the, the people you're most likely going to see. You know, you can meet photographers in Europe or North America or other countries, and, and that's great. But the ones who you're actually going to meet are usually they're the ones who are in, you know, your local area. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you, Vincent you says just... WhatsApp. I, I've never used WhatsApp chat room, but yeah. I mean, I've used WhatsApp, but not to meet photographers. OK. Yeah. Uh... So uh, just sort of about the collection, just to share with you guys, like, you know, at first, like, I, when I first met, no pay, actually, it's through a friend called Jimmy. Okay, Jimmy, I know Jimmy, and Jimmy came here, and Jimmy, uh, then I was chatting with him, and then he, the time he was with pay, and then from there, I know pay. After that, I introduced Raymond in demand to pay, when pay and Jimmy went there, and then this is how we keep expanding our circle. Yeah. So this right. is how we connect each other. Right. Um, Abby asks, what photographs are you taking during lockdown? So I'm in Singapore and I've just been going around Singapore right now. It's the mid autumn festival or it's ending. And in Chinatown, there's some lanterns. So I think, yeah, what, what can you photograph during lockdown? I, I actually really am enjoying seeing what other photographers are doing during lockdown because everyone is uh, stuck in their own country. So they're forced to photograph things in their own country that they maybe normally wouldn't photograph. And so, for example, um, yeah, uh, Gray was mentioning how we met. Uh, one of the photographers that we introduced us was um, Julian Grandin, B-Boy, B-Boy photography. Yeah. So he shared a photo. If you look on B-Boy on Instagram or Julian Grandin, I'm not sure exactly his Instagram, but he has a photo he just posted of uh, some sunflowers in, oh, I think Auvergne in France. He's in France. And yes. it's, I, I, it's not Iceland or Norway or the, the kind of typical places. I know it's near his home, but I think he's taking those photos because he can't go anywhere. But it's a gorgeous photo. I mean, he has these sunflowers and a sunset and this little building. Yeah, I, I, so, okay, I just check out the photo. I thought he, he, he just brought the sunflower everywhere to press the photo. <laughs> So it's, it's fun to see. Also, um, Albert Dross, he's in the Netherlands. I noticed he's shooting a lot more uh, Netherlands stuff. I mean, it, I think all we can do is just f pay more attention to where we're at. I think when we look at Instagram and Facebook and we are, see our friends traveling to all these places, then we want to go. And of course, it's natural you want to go there. But sometimes, like I was saying earlier, the, the best most unique photos you can take are often the ones that are within, you know, an hour or two of your own home, because you can capture these places in a way that most people wouldn't. So focus on the seasons. Uh, for example, here in Singapore, there were some trees blossoming just last month, some special purple and pink blossoms. 
um, you know, every place has its unique features. So think about the seasons, try and find things that are local, um, try a different style, maybe with a different lens. Um, like I was saying, instead of shooting with the wide angle, try using a telephoto. Um, you could photograph the moon. Uh, so yeah, basically to answer your question, I'm just trying to focus on local things, focus on seasonal things, uh, and basically just follow your curiosity and go, go to places wh where you haven't been. Yep. Uh, we have another question is from Davey. It's on Facebook Live here. So he asked about like, uh, okay, this is the, his comment. What do you do when the place is amazing, but the weather and the sky are not good and you have limited time then? How do you feel about sky replacement? You can go first. You want me to okay, answer that? Sure. Okay. Uh, for me, I'm kind of flexible with like, you know, like uh, replacing the sky and everything. It's like for me, photography is fine. Uh, of course, if possible, I try to, to go to the same place again, if that is the possible option to get the best weather as I can. I will try to buffer more days at that place so that I can get the best weather. But sometimes, let's say weather doesn't be on my side, you know, I'm okay for sky replacement. For me, it doesn't matter, it's like an art, and, but as long as you don't try to, you know, lie or try to misleading someone. You know, I saw a lot of people that uh, disagree, uh, mainly like mad about someone using the sky replacement because someone trying to deceive other, you know, just assume saying that this was like a lucky shot. Okay, but we know that it's not, you know, we can see that there's a trace of uh, super impulse and those things. But for me, it's, 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 uh, I'm okay with that. Although I don't often do that, but it's um, one of the options that I have and one of the skills that I have to do with the sky replacement. So that's my point of view. So how about you, Pete? Uh, I'm pretty much the same as you. I'm, I'm, I don't mind uh, flipping out a sky. The only thing that I don't like is when kind of like what you said if somebody says i got an epic sunset and it was like not an epic sunset it was they just did you know if they lie about it or are misleading i don't really like that however if you want to replace the sky go for it sometimes it looks fake uh, occasionally i do it i don't usually replace skies though i just kind of work with what i have or I might alter it a little bit, but I don't really replace skies. But I, I think that's the trend. It's going to happen more and more. It's happening now. It's oh, happening yeah. It's going to happen even more. Photoshop is coming out with an update where they yeah. can, you can do sky replacements in Photoshop. I saw Aliyah Lacardi has his uh, sky pack. Yeah. You can buy Aliyah Lacardi clouds if you want yeah. Yeah. for Luminar. Uh, it's, it's just, um, the way it's trend. the way it goes, you know, it's, I think this is the kind of trend in photography in the past. We were so focused on documenting the scene and seeing it exactly as it is, yes. but I really think the kind of future and trend is the way we interpret it, digital art, AI, all that stuff. I think yeah. this is the future, although there's definitely still room for people who want to keep it 100% natural. Okay. I remember I mentioned Albert Dross earlier. He likes to take photos of the moon over like between buildings and stuff. Yeah. And he said, I don't want to just people say, oh, why don't you just put the fake moon in there? You know, why don't you Photoshop the moon? Why plan and do all this stuff? But yeah, you're not doing it for the other people. When I shot the moon rising above that thing in, in the Lotus building earlier, it was so exciting to plan it, to see the moon rise above that building and know at that exact time it would be in that exact place. Like that, it's almost like a, a game of chess or, or something. It's planning and making your vision become reality. So for me, that's the, the joy of photography. Yeah. But if you want to replace it and put a moon there with some, you know, uh, an airplane flying through or Santa Claus, go for it. 
make sure you do it nicely and don't let people see that it's, it's very obviously Photoshop and make sure that you don't bring any price. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Edwin says they will usually use the word lucky in the sentence when explaining about the Yeah, phone. you know, it's like, I don't know why, you know, it's just like, <laughs> those people tend to, you know, just like creating this kind of story like, I was lucky to have a flight, the, the plane fly by, I was lucky to have a huge moon in the sky, I was like, <laughs> I don't know. What does, Abby says, no one wants to be like Ansel Adams. What do you mean by that? Ansel Abby? Adams is the, is the guy that started I, oh. the... Yeah. I, I know who Ansel Adams is, but why 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 do you not want to be like him? He was the master of the grandfather of landscape photography. Exactly. I'm curious why. I don't think he he didn't fake anything. Yeah, yeah. Oh, He's, as in a purist, maybe. Oh, Edwin says as in a purist. I don't know. Yeah, he's waiting for the professional. I remember that he said a very famous quote is that it's about where you be at the right time, at the right place, if I'm not mistaken, something like that from him i i don't know i um for me that's kind of the joy of a big part of the joy of photography i mean that's when you're in the right spot when you when you i mean it doesn't always happen there's a fine line because sometimes you could wait for so long you could wait days and it never happens yeah and you're like okay forget it but at the same time that fog photo that i showed you earlier I mean, I waited a year, like it happened a few times a year and I was like always waiting. And when I got it, that I was so happy, you know, it was that, like- That count, it, like feeling that, yeah, that achievement, it's, you know, it's yes, like- Yes, it's uh, the same with the lightning photo. Yeah. It it's goes beyond photography. It's not just about getting the shot. It's about having a vision and a creative vision and then planning and then seeing that vision come to life and actually look how you imagined it in your head. You know, yeah. like this is the, for me, that's the great joy. If I just exactly. Photoshop, totally lightning, agree with you on yeah, that. If I just Photoshop the lightning, it's not going to be the same. Although when I photo, when I Photoshop the, the Milky Way over, over Singapore, it felt great because I was realizing this vision that I had of the UFO and all that. So it just depends. And I'm not saying there's a right way or a wrong way. It's just knowing what's right for you. Yeah. So um, guys, do you guys have any more questions? If you don't have any more questions, press, we will just like, you know, call it a day. By the way, Pete, press, you can tell us that how can they find, where can they find you? Oh, sure. Uh, you can find me if you just uh, Google uh, Pete DeMarco photography or go to my website, thenomadwithin.com. You can uh, find all my links there. And on Instagram, I'm at Pete DeMarco, D-E-M-A-R-C-O. And I also have a YouTube channel. I rarely post videos, but I'm hoping to change that and the next couple months. I actually just started recording one yesterday. So you reminded me too. <laughs> yeah. So um I think that's all for today's session. I'm very I mean thank you Pete for being here with us. I'm really grateful about that. By the way for you all how you all think about this session do you want to see me having more other photographers on this Facebook live? Yes, tell me, you know, let me know in the comment or anything, okay? Uh, if you have any other question you want to ask me, you know, even though you can't think of it now, you can still like, you know, you can PM or DM me or you can just send yep. me the question, okay? Anytime. Hey, it was, it was great meeting everyone. Uh, Albert, Vincent, Chua, Edwin, Lucas, William, Willie, Chan. <laughs> um, yeah, everybody, Abby. Dino, thanks, uh, thanks for having me, Gray. It was cool to hang out and see you again. And hopefully we can meet up again soon in yeah, Kuala yeah. Lumpur. So one last time, you just show some love to Pete before I realize, you know, I send him off. <laughs> like, like, heart, follow, yeah. subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So <laughs> goodbye, guys. Thanks for being here. So I'm going to and the meeting now. Have a good sleep and good rest. Hopefully, see you guys next time in you know 
not, it's not only just in Malaysia, any other places in the world. Take care, everyone. Take care. Bye.